For when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from the heavens when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so now we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention as though it were a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own private interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but rather men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So read 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. We're continuing a series today as we study through some of the great stories in the book of Daniel. We actually looked at chapter two last week, and this week we're going to look at chapter two and seven combined. It would do well to open your Bibles if you have them with you so that we can follow along together. We're going to have lengthy readings that are so important because it allows God to tell his story rather than me telling mine. I believe all scripture is inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, and as a result, it never, never is a burden to allow God to have his voice from our pulpits. The story of Daniel in the second chapter is one that will go on to tell of young men who are thrown into a fiery furnace and yet escape by the power of God. And then later, when another king arises and another kingdom is taken over, Daniel will be cast into a lion's den. And he too will show the delivering power of God. And in between those incredible events, what we have are prophecies. Prophecies that speak of coming days, then yet long in the future. But just like prophecies look forward in time, we look back on those prophecies and we see in their fulfillment a guarantee, one that I think we need. We're in a generation that questions everything. We're in a generation where in our public schools and in our universities, truth is challenged as though it cannot be trusted and that there is no such thing as truth. The Bible says otherwise. And in fact, as you study through the scriptures, particularly the prophecies, you're going to come to this reality very quickly. You cannot escape the fact that God put himself to the test. He put himself to the test. He revealed to us prophecies through these men, and they were speaking the word of God, by God. Again, I quote from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. And as they delivered a word from God, they were speaking about, about events that would unfold th hundreds of years in the future. And in many cases, even speaking of them past tense, like Psalm 22, where it speaks of the crucifixion of Jesus. Daniel's story is not unique in biblical prophecy, because there are many places where we read about all of the prophecies that would come about the Messiah that would show up one day. In fact, there are over 400 prophecies about Jesus including the time that he would be born, the season. Daniel will contribute to that prophecy. Prophecies that speak of his birth in Bethlehem. How could they possibly have known? That it would be of the tribe of Judah. Who would have known that? The day in which he would come, the way that he would die. Psalm 22, with the greatest of accuracy, the most vivid account the most historically clear account of the crucifixion of Jesus recorded in Psalm 22, hundreds of years before it actually occurred. What does this do? It proves God's point. There is truth. And truth should convict us and cause us to live with confidence in our world. You and I live in a world filled with uncertainties. But the uncertainties are not on the Christian's side. The uncertainties are on the side of those that are lost. And what I mean by that is, I know in whom I have believed it, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep all that that I've committed to him against that day, Paul would say through the letter to Timothy. And you and I today have those same confidences in our wake. As we plow through life and we see the ripples that pass through the lives of the people we touch, we realize that in that wake is this message that should come screaming through our lifetimes and our, through our life experiences and through our, into our relationships. I know whom I have believed in and I have confidence because I have seen his fulfillment 
of his promises. In Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to read a few passages, verses 31 through 35. The king has received a vision, and he asked Daniel to come in and to tell him not only what the vision meant, but what it was. He wouldn't even tell him what the dream was. So Daniel stands in verse 31 and says, You, O king, were looking and beheld a single great statue. And that statue was large and an extraordinary splendor standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. And its head was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs were made of bronze. Its legs were made of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed him. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed. Somebody grab me a bottle of water, please. For some reason, working in my yard all of a sudden has caused me to have allergies that are driving me crazy these days. I apologize. And then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away and not a trace of them was found. But that stone that was there that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. He goes on to explain to him, O king, verse 37, that you are the king of kings uh, in this era You are the one who has power and that you, king, are going to be recognized and understood in this vision as the first kingdom, the head of bronze. He goes on to explain to him that the second in line is the Medo-Persians that would rise up and then the Alexandrian world and then the Roman world. They're all listed in this. In chapter 7, if you turn over there very quickly, you're going to see a similar vision beginning in verse 3. This is a vision that occurs not to the king, but to Daniel. And it says, the four great beasts were coming out from the sea. The sea compared to Revelation 13 is the sea, the mass of humanity. And it says that the first beast that came out of the sea was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. And I kept looking, behold, until its wings were plucked. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a human mind was given to it. And behold, another beast a second one, resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said, arise and devour much meat. And after this, I kept looking and another one like a leopard, which had on its back four wings like a bird. And beast also, this beast had four heads and a dominion was given to it. And I kept looking in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast came, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. And it had large teeth made of iron and it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. And while I was contemplating the horns, yet another horn, a little one came up from among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it came. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. And I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the ancient of days, there's our God, took his seat. And his vesture was like white snow and his hair on his head was like pure wool. And his throne was ablaze with flames and its wheels were a burning fire. And a river of fire was flowing and coming out before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending to him, our God. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him, our God. And the court set and the books were opened. And I kept looking and I couldn't believe what I saw. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. And as for the rest of those beasts, their dominion was taken away. But an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. And I kept looking and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. There's the resurrection of Jesus and the establishment of the church. And to him was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom. All authority has been granted unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. That all the people and all the nations and every language might serve him, not just the Jews, but now all people are called into the family and the kingdom of God. And they were brought together that they might serve him and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which will never pass away and his kingdom is one which will never be destroyed. And there's the church. 
It corresponds beautifully with Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 and 45, which we didn't read earlier. And in those days of those kings, and he's talking about that last, that fourth kingdom, that fourth beast, that fourth reign or rule that would be over the earth. In those last days, I will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. That's you. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all other kingdoms. That's you. It will endure forever. That's you. Inasmuch as you saw this stone cut out of the mountain without hands, that it crushed the iron and the bronze and the clay and the silver and the gold, those are all those other kingdoms. That's you. God will be made known to the king, being made known that these things will take place in the future and, may, and know that this dream is true and this interpretation is trustworthy. You say, well, Mike, what about all these images? Well, you've got that head of gold in chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Without doubt, it's Babylon. 37 and 38 say so. The king knows that it's him. He takes the imagery so far that in the next chapter, he's going to make an entire statue out of gold because I think in his mind, he's kind of hoping that maybe God will maybe change his mind and the statue will live on forever rather than having all those other lesser kingdoms come to, to power. In chapter seven, that same kingdom, Babylon, in verses three and four, is called a lion with wings like an eagle. I love the images of these beasts with wings. You know what it says? Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. There's a passage in Proverbs that says, wealth and riches are like a bird. They take wing and fly away. So don't put trust in them. You can say the same thing about these nations. But what about Babylon? It's so fierce. What about Rome and how wicked it was and how it tormented and tortured Christians? Or what about what happened in the days of the Alexandrian Empire when the Greeks ruled? That's the third kingdom. What about that? How horrible it was, how horrific. And you know what God says? Don't worry about it. The kingdoms will exist till I, don't, till I no longer want them to exist. And then they'll just take wing and they'll fly away. In chapter five, the night when the Babylonian empire falls, they're having a great feast, celebrating what they think is the end of the reign of God. 70 years have passed, God has not shown up to deliver his people, we've defeated him. Go to the temple, go to the temple of our gods, get the emblems that we've kept in the treasury that we brought back from Jerusalem when we conquered it 70 years ago. We've been a little nervous about this, fearful of it. My father and grandfather even gave honor, but you know what? It's over. Go bring the goblets and let's drink wine from it and celebrate the conquest, the defeat of the Hebrew God. And before the night was over, that king lay dead in his own blood, conquered by the Medo-Persians. Because in all of their celebration, somebody forgot to lock the gate to the city and literally, the Medo-Persians walk in and knock on the door of the palace. And the king, in essence, says, go see who it is. And before he can almost acknowledge that there is a God in heaven, he dies. Why? Because God's will will always be done. We live in an age when there are people who are fearful of nuclear attack from Russia because it seems it could be imminent. And there are others who are fearful of China and the great uprising that could happen with their billions and billions of people that could come into, or billions of people that could come into this country and wipe us out and take us over. The United States is not sovereign in God's eyes. It is only here because God has chosen to allow it to be here. And if this world goes on long enough, it is highly likely that this United States will fall because no kingdom lasts forever on earth. That's even a biblical prophecy. But we should not fear. Babylon could not withstand God's decree, nor could the Medo-Persian empire that arises. This breast and arms of silver, In chapter 2 and verse 39, it says, after you there will arise a kingdom inferior to you. Do you notice that in that statue, it starts with gold, then it drops to silver, then it drops to bronze, then it drops to iron and clay. Why do you think that is? Is every kingdom lesser, inferior than the one before? 
That's kind of the language in chapter 2 and verse 39. You know, the Medes, they lasted as a dynasty for maybe 836 years or so, but our first appear in 836, but they never really get a solid grasp on their reign. They're kind of overwhelmed by the Assyrians and the Babylonians early on. They get this brief window where they come in and they got to come into power because God said they got to come into power. And then after a couple hundred years, away they go. And now they're back in to bondage in essence or subservience to the Greeks. Not quite the gold of Babylon. It says in chapter 7, verse 5, that they're described as a bear raised up on one side, standing on its hindquarters. Think of it that way. With ribs in its mouth. You get that image of a bear coming at you? The ribs, the conquest, eat much meat, the conquest of all these other nations. But do you notice they never become part of the bear? They're still just ribs in his mouth. You see, their conquest is never complete. It's never ultimately accomplished. but all the destruction that came with it. And then after that, we have that belly and thighs of brass being the Greeks. Another kingdom, a kingdom of bronze, chapter two, verse 39 says, that will rule over all the world. Jameson said that the Greeks were known for their brass or bronze colored armor that they wore in battle. Well, how in the world would Daniel have had any way of knowing that brass or bronze would be a metal that well described a people that would come 400 years after he spoke. Because it wasn't Daniel. It was God speaking through Daniel. And God had already ordained. Acts 18 says, chapter 17 says, that God has appointed the boundaries of the habitations of the people that dwell on the earth. And that simply means God has appointed a day of beginning and a day of end for each kingdom on earth. And you say, why would he do that? Because kingdoms rise and fall according to what best suits the accomplishment of the will of God. In class this morning, we were praying and someone said, well, let, let's pray for the economy. And I said, well, what do we want to pray for? That it gets good or that it gets bad? Well, of course, everybody looked at me kind of like, are you crazy? No, I'm not crazy. Which way does God want? You see, there are times when a good economy defeats God's purpose. And there are times when a bad economy defeats God's purpose. There's a time when this country needs to rise and really be strong and it works to God's purpose. And there is a time possibly when this country may be called upon from the heavens to see its last day. And if that happens, it will be because it fits God's purpose. Bible prophecy gives us confidence in knowing that God has a plan for the world. But by the way, there's something unique that happens here in this section. You see, what we have in this belly and thighs, this third kingdom of bronze, we see Alexander the Great's influence on the world. And it's interesting how the Bible gets so particular right here. Alexander lived from 356 to 323 BC. Died very young, about age 32. Up until he was 16, it was Aristotle that tutored him. He he succeeded his father Philip to the throne when he was only 20 years old and in only 10 years, he conquered the known world. Undefeated in battle, his kingdom stretched from Greece to India, one of the largest empires ever built in the history of the world. You know all of that. You also probably know that in 323, He shows up in Babylon in Nebuchadnezzar's palace and probably that day was assassinated by poisoning, though there's some debate. But do you notice that it says in chapter 2 and verse 32 rather that it is a kingdom described as one with bronze in its not only its thighs, plural, but its belly. Do you know that in the original manuscripts that we have, the word belly is plural? Why? Well, 
Do you notice in chapter 7 and verse 6 that it's a leopard with four wings? Again, the wings denoting the rise of the kingdoms, but there's another four in that passage. It says it is a beast with four heads. Historians know that when the Greek commander finally reaches the point, Alexander, where he dies, his kingdom splits into four parts, four heads, according to his four generals, out of great conflict. Belly, plural, two. Thighs, plural, two. It's a single kingdom, thighs and belly, but at the same time, it's four because it's a plural belly and plural thighs, but at the same time, it's two because it's a belly and it's thighs. One, two, and four. What's interesting, at first, Greece was one, but then it became four. And then in the end, in its consolidation, it ends up ultimately being a kingdom that really is best described as two, Syria and Egypt. Isn't it fascinating that the Bible knew all of that? You say, well, why didn't God actually spell that out with greater detail? Could he have spelled it out with greater detail? Well, Bill Brandt pointed out some things to me the other day. Might be good to go to chapter eight right here just for a moment. Because chapter eight speaks about this. And it says, beginning in verse, I'm going to read three verses, verse three, verse five, and verse nine. Then I lifted my gaze and looked, and behold, a ram, that's the Medo-Persians you'll see in a minute. He tells you that's what it is. I saw a ram with two horns standing in front of the canal. Medo-Persians, two horns, the Medes and the Persians, two, right? Two horns. The two horns were long, but one was longer than the other. One had greater influence than the other clear. Verse 5, I saw a male goat coming, here's the Greeks, from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen, and rushed him with his mighty wrath. There's the overthrow of the Medo-Persian world by the Greeks. Verse 9, and out of them one came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the beautiful land. There's the promised land of God. Whatever this beast, whatever this horn does, it's directed at the people of God, the Jews. Put all of those together and here's what you come up with. Out of the Grecian world came this small horn that grew. This small horn that seems to have this tremendous influence it grew up to the host of heaven, started to torture even to the host of heaven. It caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to earth, it literally caused some of the faithful to fall away. And it trampled them down and it magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. Whoever this was, he took a position that he was going to wipe out the command of God. It removed the regular sacrifice from him and the place of his God's sanctuary was thrown down and on account of the transgression of the host, that's the transgression of Israel, these things will be given over to the horn with the regular sacrifice and it will fling the truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Almost all scholars agree that this is Antichus, the great madman as the Jews called him. In chapter eight and verse 12, we speak of this great transgression that came, this great judgment that came that brought, was brought upon God's people because of their sins. About 160 years before Christ came, this man would rise up. And he sought to completely destroy the Hebrew faith, the Israelites. He issued the death penalty for anyone who was circumcised. He issued the death penalty to anyone who observed the law. Once a month, he would pass through the city and he would search homes and if he found any copy of the old law, he would execute the people who possessed it. In 168 BC, he built the pagan altar in the temple of God. He dedicated Jerusalem and the, temp and the temple of God to the god Zeus. 
he brought a pig and sacrificed it on the holy altar. And he took its blood and sprinkled it over all of the implements on the inside of the temple. The Feast of Tabernacle was turned into the Feast for Bacchus, the god of wine. He auctioned off the office of high priest. He murdered at least 100,000 Jews. There he is right there. Hundreds of years, 600 years before it ever happened. And then Rome shows up. The legs of iron, the feet part iron and clay. And for a thousand years between 625 BC and 476 AD, Rome had its place. This fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Chapter 2 verse 40 says, but it shall be a divided kingdom. Well, how do you know that? Because I'm God. That's what he says. It was a divided kingdom, and we know that it was divided into two empires, with Rome and Constantinople being the two, king, the two uh, capitals. Chapter 7, verse 7 says, It's a fourth beast, dreadful, terrifying, strong, large iron teeth with ten horns. Several theories about the ten horns, but it's sufficient to say that it's a massive power. It is astounding to consider the extent of these prophecies. Absolutely astounding. I, do you know that Isaiah 45, 300 years before the event, says that Cyrus is going to be the one who returns the Jews home before he was even alive? You want to know why I believe the Bible's true? Because you can't come up with any other explanation. That's why Daniel is one of the most challenged books by, the, by critics of Scripture that there are. Because as a book, you can't get around it. I'm not even going to go into the details. I challenge you to go home and just read what is said in chapters 7 and chapters 8 and chapters 9 and chapter 11 and chapter 12. And what you're going to find is that, my goodness, God knew the future before it ever unfolded. They're astounding. The prophecies about Babylon dying or being wiped out and the Medo-Persians coming into power. Listen, that happened 70, that, that prophecy was given 70 years before it happened. The prophecy about the rise of Greece and Alexander the Great and all of that, the four generals, 300 years before it ever happened. The prophecies about the rise of Rome, 600 years before they unfolded. And then you've got all those prophecies of our Messiah, over 400 of them. And again, I challenge you to read Psalm 22 and see. Friends, when I read Daniel, it makes me want to fall on my knees and say, as Thomas did, when he put his hand in the side of Jesus and touched the scars on his, the nail prints in his hands, my Lord and my God, because there is no other explanation as to how these things can possibly have been said. There is none. Why am I a Christian? The evidence is there. The next time someone tells you, you serve a God out of just blind faith. No, you're the one that's blind. If you would read these stories and these prophecies, you would understand what Peter meant when he said, we have the prophetic word made more sure. We see it. The future events that are yet to unfold, this judgment that is coming, it's not a pipe dream. It's not a wish. It's not just a hope. It's a reality. The great judgment scene is in here. The church is in here. I am in here. You are in here. It ought to make us live differently. Look, I'm saying all of this today to pull this final thought out. We are in a world that right now seems to be in some stages of turmoil. I say stages because depending on what you're looking at, the US, Ukraine, all the stuff in Russia and China and the uncertainties that are in the world, the physical things we just came through with COVID and all this stuff. 
And it is so easy to look at that and fear that God has forgotten us. He hasn't. They ought to give us confidence to know that, look, that's not even my realm. I have a friend, a very, past this about a year and a half ago, but one of the most uh, scholarly men I have ever known. And I remember him telling me, you know, I have no interest at all in worldly issues. Who's in charge? Who's the president? Who's a governor? Who's, I have no interest at all and have no interest in being involved in it on any level. And I used to think that was weird. I thought, well, this is the world we live in. And he would just look at me and say, no, it isn't. You know what he was trying to tell me that I was too stupid to figure out? That isn't the world I live in. That's the world I live in. You see, all of these things that are happening on earth, that's the hand of, that's God's realm. He's the one that brings the nations to power as he wills. He's the one that brings them down. He's the one that orchestrates all of this. I don't care who the president is. It really doesn't matter. What matters is who's the king. When you figure that out, the rest of this stuff is dust in the wind. And you can go to bed at night and close your eyes with the greatest of peace because our God is in charge. Our God is in charge. I want to read one passage and I quit. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And I kept looking. He was so disturbed. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he did. That's our Jesus. And Jesus, he came up to the ancient of days. There's the great Jehovah God. And Jesus, he was presented before our great God. You know when this was, right? This is the resurrection. This is the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And to him was given dominion. That's what he received when he came out of that grave. And glory and a kingdom so that all the people and all the nations and men of every language might serve him. And here's where I find my confidence. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which shall never ever be destroyed.